Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, former Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny Beattie, and five-time European Cup finalist, Benjamin Kayser, as we're calling him every week now, I think. <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> um, we'll get on to talking about the Champions and Challenge Cup finals shortly after French teams did the double in those competitions for the first time since 1997. And we've got a Champions Cup winning guest from the weekend joining us as well a little bit later on with an incredible tale to tell. So we'll get to that as well. But we've also got some big news to not really break because it's not been announced yet. But we think, don't we, Benji? We think French rugby, the top 14, may be coming well, to back to UK screens. Well, we think actually the basically the dreams and the hopes of all our precious, precious listeners have been answered. Because every, I, there's not a week that goes by without a message sent up. Like, How the hell do we watch top 14? How do you do it? Well... Either you do like me, which is don't tell anyone. But illegally. I use my, 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 I use, no, no, not illegally. I just use I use French codes, but, but internet doesn't pick it up anymore. So it's okay. You watch it online. Or then there's finally uh, a basically a, a, a channel over in the UK that sees the absolute exquisite uh, spectacle that is top 14, that it's going to, only get, going to get bigger and bigger until 2023. And they finally decide to, to show it. So my little finger tells me that somebody did... <laughs> And I think that is particularly smart and well played. And I can't wait for people to showcase everything that we see. Probably so more on that next week. But um, Johnny, have you, you've submitted all of our CVs. Yeah, they're all <laughs> obviously they're all a, long, a long time ago. <laughs> Look, Benji's little pinky and my whole arm. Um, I've been saying we're, we're, we're definitely, we're mad as mustard. We're keen as mustard. Um, Look, it's been two, three seasons now that it hasn't been shown at all in the UK. Um, and it's a bit desperate. Like, Everybody knows it's one of the best leagues, the best French players, massive foreigners. And look, there's carnage in one way or another every single week. So it's good viewing. So look, I'm just delighted. Hopefully it's been picked up. And I know all of our listeners have been saying they're desperate to be back on their screen. So hopefully from next season in the UK and Ireland, you'll be able to watch it. And uh, we won't have to do it illegally anymore, which would be great. So, so fingers crossed. The, the only issue, the only issue is that we're going to get called out for talking so much shit because for the last year, People we've are been watch. inventing, <laughs> inventing everything that we've been saying. So there's, there's, there's no more, you know, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. But if the story is well, well said, you know, well, well told, then we're all good. Let's have a look at the European finals now then. And um, we bumped into each other at Twickenham on Saturday, didn't we, Benji? Um, you were there pitch side for both finals. So did you have a good weekend with the fans at Twickenham? Oh, mate, it was awesome. We'll, we'll talk about it. Ask me later how my week was because I had a great week also. Pretty intense, but finally with some sort of uh, London face-to-face -face interactions with, you know, I don't know, business, friends, mates, restaurants, whatever, and a shit ton of wine, obviously. Don't tease us, Ben. You tell us now. We want to get it. We can't wait. I can't wait. Right. Get it out. All right. On Wednesday at lunch, I had lunch at the table oh. in at which the Queen had her 89th birthday. Boom fa. Hold Try to on beat that one. Minute. Mate, I'm not joking. So I've got a mate of a mate who's basically who works for Barry Brothers and Rudd. And he was absolutely delightful enough to invite us for lunch. And I think that was one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. They've got four pitchers worth, four football pitchers worth of wine cellars in the center of London. It's a place like I've never seen before. It's 365 years old. Uh, it's, it's going down to the, the like first, year, you know, tea and coffee were the hot things. Then it was spirit and then wine became gold, basically. So it's just full of history, full of crazy knowledge, beautiful scenery. Everything that I like about England, because it, it, there is a bit of wine. wine on top of it. <laughs> it's like history, tradition, um, you know, it's, everything comes through through blood and, and everything's um, old fashioned and there's a protocol and everything, but very relaxed, very chill, not snobbish at all. For, yeah, full, full of, uh, of historical heritage. And, and I had the best lunch ever. <laughs> Just period. It was, it was unbelievable. And What'd you have? Oh, I can't even remember, but I know that we drank some Bourgogne, which was, <laughs> was absolutely <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> That uh, I'm not a burgundy guy, to be honest. I, I'm not. And and it was just to die for. Uh, so, no, I wow. can't, can't, you know, those guys, the unfortunate thing is that I told them, boys, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be knocking on that door every single week now. But uh, but it was, no, no, it was, it was unreal. And then to answer your question about Twickenham, Twickenham was exquisite. Not the best quality of rugby on either game, but 10,000 fans, the Cathedral of Rugby took it in, uh, both teams or four teams who properly went at each other. 
Uh, Challenge Cup final wasn't extraordinary in terms of rugby production, yes. But boy, did Montpellier won it. Uh, so I wasn't pitch out. I was doing the comms. And at the end for the French TV, we saw Guillaume Girardot and stuff. They were all in tears. Girardot was, was crying in the arms of Forletta, the loose head prop, the young buck from, from Perpignan, with Benoit Payot. Fufio Drago was absolutely in tears. Mohamed Altrad uh, announced that he's going to stay in Montpellier for the next 10 years, which is go <laughs> good and bad. But, you know, it's, it's always exciting. I promise you, it, there was genuine, genuine relief and happiness. And it was, it, it was awesome to see. You could tell that Bismarck Duplessis was playing his last minutes of top-level rugby, and he was chuffed to get that title, potentially the last one of his career. I don't yeah. know. Um, and it, those just beautiful moments. And you, you genuinely saw it. Like, again, Kobus Renac, Andre Pollard, right? Nine and ten of only the world champions. Um, and, and, and they were chuffed, and they were jumping like 17-year-olds. And it, that was, it was just delightful to see. Uh, really happy for Philippe Saint-André and all his staff and stuff. And so they did well. And then obviously on Saturday, then the game was bigger and brighter, not more extraordinary rugby. And we'll, we'll get into it after. But 10,000 people, 10,000 people, boys. How good. That was, that, was, that was genuinely good. And a lot of people absolutely pissed to their minds after the game, wobbling about, singing <laughs> stupid songs, pulling their pants down, everything we like about rugby. Johnny, any um, any lunches with the Queen, or what did you make of the, oh, the final? That's what you want to give you. Oh, Mine you, is going to be. Remember what crap. I said to you. Remember what I said to you. Don't get the truth and get away with a good story. Exactly. I had lunch yeah. with the Queen on Wednesday. <laughs> That's, That's, it. That's what I had. Uh, May yeah. I? I don't, I don't even know where to. May I? Picking up from last week, where I said I was going to spend the week doing my deck and removing bamboo. That's exactly what I did. So it was nothing compared to what Benji's been up to. It's been extremely <laughs> sad. Um, I even had to give away tickets that I had for both games to mate. So got photos of them having beers and enjoying it and loving life. Um, and Luke watched it with my neighbors. Bizarrely, had a couple of beers, another Cote de Boeuf, another weekend in Southern France. Nothing really changes. And like you said, Benji, like the actual, in terms of the spectacle, the rugby wasn't fantastic, but what it meant to them, like both sides at the end, you could see the absolute delight. Intermax, Dupont, like their confirmation, they're here, their generation, they're... It's their time, basically, and absolutely was. Um, and we'll get into the game at the minute. I wanted to ask you, Benji, going back to what you talked about last week, about how you sort of had some regrets about not putting all out there or not giving it everything. For me, it looked like that final was essentially game plans abandoned and everybody just putting everything into physicality, fight, and wanting it more than the other side. Would that be fair? Yeah, but to the point where... Like we said last week, it's European. It's it was both were European finals, and Montpellier did a terrific job in the Challenge Cup final. But Leicester just did not play any rugby. Uh, I mean, even when they had penalty advantages and stuff, George Ford would still kick the ball in the corner and stuff. I just wouldn't really understand what was going on because when they did play, they've got this Kelly guy who plays twelve. I don't know where he's from, but bloody hell, he's a good center. Yeah. They've got um, Mo, uh, Matias Moroni, bloody hell, the Argentinian who tackles like an animal. And he's really good. Uh, they've got uh, the, the, the fullback. fullback which I is rate him as well, like, the young kid. Mate, he's he's awesome. really good. Incredible in the air and stuff. And I was excited to see them. Nadolo barely had a, a ball and all that. But So basically, I was just frustrated because I just felt they played with a little bit of a, a, le frame, a little bit of handbrake, handbrake in terms of 100%. A, a little bit of, of, of a lack of, you know, I, I, I don't want to get scared. I don't want to take a risk. I don't want to take the chance to do it. Eddie and Jones. And, did it look well, like they've been coached by? And mate, they kicked everything. So like, I was watching it, thinking, if you're a Tigers fan, right, in terms of spectacle and what you want, they did like some bits right. Like their driving mall was insane, but then yeah. there was nothing off the back of it. I'm like, you've just yeah. demolished a French pack, and you've got 30 meters of gain line. Do something with the ball, and they just didn't. It was the strangest thing, like you said. And again, like I know they've got a good kicking game, but like they kicked the ball to death. I'm like, if you just tried something a little bit different, I think they could have won. Yeah. But I was delighted Montpellier did because the journey Montpellier, but again, both sides are on a journey, but the journey Montpellier have been on, the confidence that they've gained over the past two months, the job that Philippe Saint-André has done, you could just tell when they got ball in hand in areas where they felt they could play, they played. And that was the difference. Yeah. They played and you look, with and, a and smile and on the their faces, offloaded, took chances. It was great. Exactly. And the two guys who took chances are the smallest guy on the Montpellier pitch. It was Gabriel Ngandébé, the little black winger, who went lightning fast, caught a ball in so the air, quick. stepped a guy, went through, gave it to Benoît Payog, who honestly is about 70 kgs with a coat on. 
and and you know steps a guy in this and that. so it's just for the symbolic everybody's like, oh montpellier a bunch of you know mercenaries of safas of big lumps and stuff well the two skinniest french dudes basically turned that game around and and they did really well but like you said it's is those two teams played a little bit of full-on aggressivity let's put everything in the mauling brawling uh intensity part of the game but the two teams who won are the one who who just seized a little bit more the opportunity. Romain Tamak had one incredible pass to throw against Toulouse and he nailed it. Um, and, and that's about it. But even Toulouse didn't really take a chance. I mean, we were looking at the game from, I was pitch side, so, you know, you get the, the, the images all the time. And even when, after Botia got sent off for absolutely murdering Max Medar, um, <laughs> then he, he, they didn't play. They didn't take a chance, you know? So I think there was a sense of, it's a final. We do not want to lose it. And we're gradually going to get there. But still, both teams who delivered and who seized the title at the end are the ones who, just when they've sniffed it, or teams or players, just when they sniffed it, they seized that opportunity and it's well-deserved. And you mentioned Botti's red card, Benji. Obviously, as clear-cut as it gets, pretty oh, pretty shuddering to all watching, let alone being involved in it. Should Maxim Medar have been removed straight away? Because he played 150%. on for a bit. Oh, 150%. 150%. And I'm actually, to be honest, so so I was doing it for BT. We were bit side, but as soon as the game is on, you go up to a box so that we can have all the screens. And we could, so you could watch it inside or outside. And, you know, you still have your earpiece. And the earpiece, you see the live commentary, but the TV is four seconds later. So I, I was going, losing my stuff. So I just took my earpiece, <laughs> so I went outside. And just as we went outside and we were walking to the middle, the hit happened. I swear to you, I heard a bone break from the stands. It, I've never oh. heard not seen, heard such a, a, a full-on impact. It, it's like a tree, you know, a tree starts falling down and he goes, Krah! that's the noise that it made. I, I, oh, I actually, I was, I was looking at Max and I was thinking, please get up. F- forget about the red card. I was like, I hope he's okay. It's that bad. I really thought he chopped him in half. Oh, that is just that, that's, it's a car crash. And it really got me scared. And to be honest, his, his head, you know, properly waxed back. He's on the floor for a couple of seconds. Okay, the, the ref maybe didn't see exactly the point of, 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 of contact. So you can, you can get from yellow to red pretty quick. But how the hell that in that moment, in that, what, that minute maybe that it took him to change the decision, how the hell didn't they pull Max Miller off? I think that's, that's really absolutely careless. And, the, and I don't understand how it happened. And the same thing happened a couple of minutes before, after I can't remember, with the big second row, uh, Arnold, yeah. who knocked himself out. Or oh, I can't remember if it's the shoulder or something, but he stayed on the floor, start, tried to get back up. And you know, you do those couple of steps back and he stay, stayed in there because his brother got injured what after 10 minutes of the game or something like that, 10 minutes in. So there's a sense of me, oh, we can't really afford to lose another lock or something. And he stayed on. And that, that was just, yeah, that, that pissed me off a bit because I think you, you final, not final, you need to take care of the boys. And Max Medal was in serious trouble and apparently he's fine now and I'm delighted the decision obviously Botia didn't mean to hurt him it's just the exact aggressivity of, of rugby and you try to chop it in half and you're allowed to do that but just just not that high and Johnny hindsight's a wonderful thing but apart from the red card the incident we all agree on on what Benji was just saying there yeah was it a selection gamble that didn't quite pay off because before the red card Botti didn't <clears> really look like he was fair I mean I think we know how important he is we we may all have picked him but yeah. He didn't quite look there, did he? Well, look, I think he'd only had something like 20, 30 minutes prep at total before the game, um, which is a huge ask for anyone going into that type of final. But look, the physicality and the edge that he brings, he's just so important to them. Um, and I think if you're the coaching staff and he says, look, I'm ready, I can do this, you absolutely put him in. He's pivotal to how they play. Uh, and he's great. He is great every single week for them. And maybe it's just a case of him being undercooked, not quite having the right reaction times, the quite sharp, the right sharpness. But look, if there's one bloke you don't want to be hit like that by, yeah. it's Botia. Because when he hits, he sticks. And he's so powerful and so strong and so low to the ground. And that, like you said, Benji, you, like everybody felt it here on TV. Like everybody just caved and cringed instantaneously. It was such a big collision. And I actually thought the referee team, refereeing team did a really good job. Like I think initially he was yellow carded for not being back 10 meters for the quick tap. Was that right? Yeah. So that was, so it was actually the team that was in the bus, the ref team that picked up and said, no, no, you have to go back and look at this because otherwise he's going to get away. So he was only off the pitch on a yellow card because he hadn't retreated 10 meters. The ref on the field actually hadn't seen the incident and hadn't seen the collision. So I thought it was great work in the way they called it back. 
an absolutely player safety, but look, 100%, he has to go off the pitch straight away. Like that is one of the biggest we've ever seen. <laughs> the protocols are there in place for a reason. The rules are there in place for a reason to protect the headspace and to protect against these knocks. Um, and look, I just hope he's okay now. It was absolutely colossal. Yeah. Huge hit. Just, to, Tim, to answer your question about how we should have Ronan Ogara picked him or not, Ronan Ogara answered the question perfectly, didn't he? And I thought it was pretty ballsy of him, to be fair. He said, he said what you said, John. He said, listen, it's, it's, probably down, it's probably my fault. He wasn't ready, but he's my star player. I wanted to give it a shot. And obviously, he wanted to overcompensate maybe his, his few mistakes by breaking you know, one mega tackle that you know that it hits one player, but it affects the whole Toulouse side if they know they're going to be hit like that. And, and mm-hmm. Ronaldo Gara almost raised his hand at the end, said that it's on him, really. So I think he sort of agrees with what you were heading towards. Which was outstanding by Ogara as well, because you understand how low Botia is going to feel after that. So to take some responsibility oh, yeah. and, and put it back on himself was really big of Ronan as well. But yeah. look, that's it. We've all been in that position. You're undercooked, you're going into the game, you don't have your rhythm. You want to find your way in or make an impact because you're there for a reason. And that's it. Look, it's just been unfortunate, mistimed. And yeah, massive hit. I don't know what's worse, the hit that he took or the four-day bender he's just been on. I don't know which is going to be worse, but I just hope he's okay. It was a huge collision. And we'll come on to some of the more, some of the interesting moments from the game a bit later on. But you mentioned the bender, some of the celebrations from the the negative to the positive, some of the celebration scenes were pretty special, weren't they? I mean, have you two ever taken ski goggles to a, to a rugby game? Those shots of Peter Aki, <laughs> that, Charlie, that Charlie that family. I don't know Peter Hackey at all. Uh, I'm not a I want, I want fan, to. <laughs> but that picture, I think I, could, I would frame it. It represents absolute happiness when he's got he's got those those goggles and he's getting champagne burn on him. But listen, we've how many times do we mention Big Joe on this on on this podcast? Probably 25 times. And not Every only did week, he go, at least once. not 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 only did he go steal the you know the the corner the touch corner uh, flag. But then he held it as a flag and he was there on the celebration. I mean, who does that? Nobody's going to tap on his shoulder. Uh, mate, sorry, could you leave this? That, that thing is in Toulouse and he's held it the whole time. So the, 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 the freak of nature, but legend of a boy that he is, Joe, I'm telling you, he will be leading that charge. And I know from mates in Toulouse, because I got, I remember I told you my business partner, Julien Marcin's uh, cousin, and he told me Joe slept about half an hour in four days. He's just un, unmovable, that kid. And, and he will celebrate, but now the celebrations officially took an end uh, last night. Officially, yes, but let's find out if they are still going. Maybe Joe's still out there. No, 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 no. They've got Clermont. <laughs> they've got Clermont at home on Saturday. And to be right. honest, Joe's not playing. Bomb squad. <laughs> squad no, no, for that no, one. No, no, <clears throat> no, no, no. They're gonna they're gonna get kicked out of the top two. Bordeaux are racing like hell. And they're gonna if they get to, uh, another it. five points, they back in the top two. No, you said top three. <laughs> I said, oh, come on, mate, they... give me two or three. Come on. No, me no, but it means that Toulouse will not be directly qualified for the for the semis. So they absolutely need to win this weekend against Clermont. Clermont need to win to stay in the top six. And next week, Toulouse uh, go to Bordeaux. So no, no, Toulouse are in, under massive pressure. Wow, with a few injuries as well, they picked up. Absolutely. Back, back, no, no, after no, four-day bender, I, I don't, I, I don't want to, you know, chuck water on, on their party, but it's, it's they're under pressure now, and that's why I spoke to Julien Marchand yesterday, and he's like, no, 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 we, we stopped last night because for those of us who are going to play, and hopefully he will play and stuff, it's serious. We, we desperately need the points this weekend. Well, let's find out just how good those Toulouse celebrations were then and have a chat with a man who's rise to the top of European rugby and the title of Champions Cup winner. It's been about as steep and remarkable. As possible, really. To lose second row, Thibaut Flamand joins us. And are you still pinching yourself, Thibaut? Can you believe you're a European Cup winner? Uh, not really, no. no I'm still, still quite shocked about it, really. But uh, yeah, no, it still, still feels weird. And we'll come on to more about your journey a bit later on. But we were just chatting about the photos we've seen of the celebrations. And particularly a guy that we mention every week on the show, Big Joe Takori. Is he still going <laughs> strong? Is he, has he stopped yet? Is he still got the corner flag? Tell us. I think he's still he's stronger than ever. <laughs> he didn't even charge for the last uh, last few days. He's he's impressive to be fair. He's he's impressive on the pitch, off the pitch, uh, on the night out, on the on the sh- on the sesh. He's he's impressive, truly impressive. Talk us through the past few days, mate. As soon as that final whistle is gone, how's it been evolving? You straight on the on the plane back to Toulouse and partying in Toulouse, or what's been happening? 
Um, yeah, no. So on the so first of all, when the after the, the final whistle, like it was just a surreal moment. Uh, just yeah, truly special. Boy, you've probably heard that so many times already, but uh, but it really was, and uh, still can't believe it. It has uh, happened. But uh, but yeah, no. So we uh, it all happened really quickly. To be fair, we uh, now we enjoyed a bit ourselves on the pitch. Did a little um, uh, went around the, the the stadium with the trophy for the fans and everything. Went into the changing rooms, and um, and yeah, and then everything kicked on from there. And uh, yeah, bottles pouring everywhere, like music, everyone like screaming, dancing, taking pictures and everything it was absolutely amazing. And uh, and then, oh, yeah, so we headed to uh, to to do straight away. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was a bit uh, a bit unfortunate, really, but um, went straight to Toulouse. But uh, but yeah, we did have a good time, like on the plane as well. And uh, we arrived in Toulouse as well. And, um, and yeah, and it's been really nonstop for like three days. So, uh, so yeah, it's been it's been huge, absolutely huge. And did you have your ski goggles packed as well in your bag, or was that just Peter Aki <laughs> and Charlie Fanwin? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that thing going on. But yeah, they they all they all were ready for this apparently. <laughs> so you got champagne in the eyes. Your your eyes must be stinging. That's why they're like a little bit bloodshot. Yeah. <laughs> Peter Aki's are fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was he was so ready for it. But yeah, it was uh, yeah, I had loads of my eyes. I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, so it was just it was a mix of like. Happiness, emotion, screaming, and then champagne in the eyes. Like, fuck, need to get this off. <laughs> I still have to keep going as well. But that no, was funny. Honestly, it was funny. And your timing's been impeccable because obviously France has just opened up. So bars and restaurants, you can actually go out and have a beer. So have you managed to get into the mixer in Toulouse and actually go out and mix with people and celebrate with everyone? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Probably not as much as we would uh, have liked, but uh, but we did have a, have a really good time. We When we arrived in Toulouse, uh, so uh, Saturday night, uh we uh there was like an event at the club going on and uh yeah, a lot of people mostly like families and friends and uh so that was great and then the the next day obviously all the the bars were open so uh, uh everyone was like at some bars in uh, in toulouse uh she uh she Tonton, which is a famous one uh in uh in toulouse and uh and then we all gathered again at the um at a restaurant uh like a nice terrace and everything and uh we just stayed there for the whole day um and then yeah yeah just yeah literally just stayed there the whole day and that was great really good really good to uh to share and uh and then yesterday we went to um to the beach um there was like a like a like a beach bar uh beach bar thing and we we spent the day there and yeah we could mix a bit with, with people and stuff like yeah as i said like not as much as we would have loved but uh but yeah it was, it was still really good and big j took the corner flag from twickenham did you get a souvenir or not <laughs> Um, no, I didn't. Well, I think all my memories are, are in there. <laughs> Probably lost a few in the in the nights, but um, but no, no, I didn't take any anything physical. But yeah, it was funny to see him. Care. Like he kept he like he wouldn't let go. <laughs> he wouldn't let go. He kept him like on the plane, and yeah, he's 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 a funny character. To tell you how much he's how much he's a legend, I was right on the pitch when you guys finished basically in that little corner when he got kicked out. It took him about sixty seconds to realize that he's won and that, oof, I need a trophy. And he turned around and he picked it up. It was like, into, everybody's still jumping in the air, you know, hugging each other and they couldn't believe what, what they've just done. And Joe, animal instinct, he's like, oof, I need, I need to get myself a trophy because they're going to be a massive piss up and I need something special. And he already went to, to steal it. No, mate, it was, it was absolutely spectacular. And to be honest, I think you can, you can be proud because if, if you and Guillaume Marchand and all those boys don't sprint really, really quick for that last ruck, where explain to me how did you guys almost cock it up again by thinking that the yeah, game is finished and there's still five seconds to go. I'm like, come on, not again. Um, but you guys sprinted back and you did well. So you, listen, when you needed to deliver, you delivered that last ruck. Uh, BTG yeah. Sport were trying to say that there were 700 penalties in that ruck. I didn't see any. And to be honest, you need to have a <laughs> massive set of balls from the from Luke Pierce to actually blow that one there. But fair play, you were there at the right time. Yeah, yeah, no, that was a that was a really tricky one. Obviously, we saw we saw the things the uh, we saw that happening, and we all like sprinted in there because we thought, fuck, now we can't. This can't happen, surely. And uh, and uh, yeah, no, I think so. The, the problem was uh, so from what I heard is like uh, I think Peter was uh, was saying to Rome, uh, yeah, fin. So Romain heard, yeah, it's finished. But Peter was saying, uh, you've got this left, so 10 seconds left. And Rom, I think, understood it's finished. So uh, so it was based on a language barrier thing. And so, uh, <laughs> so Rom asked for the ball to, uh, to Antoine. And, uh, and Toto passed him the ball. And then, thankfully, he did look at the at the oh, board and God. realized that, <laughs> that it wasn't on. And uh, and fuck yeah, when we saw that happen, it was like, now nah, we, we just like, we have to throw the last, the, last, uh, the last bit of energy we have. Like, everything has to go into that ruck. And talk us through because you you were on for that those final moments. So, what does Hugo Mala say? Does he when he when you go on? Does he does he give you any words of advice? What 
how does that how does that go down uh no yeah just to uh to keep to like to enjoy the moment to uh to give everything i have and to uh yeah just to enjoy the moment and try to contribute as much uh, as possible for the team uh nothing nothing pretty much is outstanding but uh but also like when you come on for the fun even though it's the the last moments of the game like uh I'm not like the, the biggest protagonist of, of the game, like coming in uh, at the right, right at the end. But uh, but yeah, no, yeah, that's what, that's what he said to me. Right, I'm, I'm listening. Like, I'm listening to you to this guy uh, Johnny, and I think I'm gonna have to push him down the stairs because his English is absolutely yeah, impeccable. <laughs> you're finished. You, you're gonna you're, you're gonna be mate. You you've got ten years, and then you're gonna be stepping on in my boots. Right? I was the only guy who could speak <laughs> decent English. You're gonna actually, you know, tu vas me couper l'herbe sous le pied. You're gonna chop, <laughs> chop the grass out of my feet, man. You gotta do. Explain. I'm sure Tim will, will dig into it. But listen, I've been hearing about you for the last two years, and and explain to me how a guy, my neighbor, well, my neighbor. There's two two houses between us. It's a guy called Max who plays ten and twelve. Who was with you at Loughborough Uni? Who's now playing oh, yeah. at Tunbridge Wells? And explain to me how I coach from time to time a guy you know who's thirty who lives who plays in Tunbridge mm -hmm. Wells, and then I'm speaking to you. And and you just you just won the fifth star for for the Stade Toulousain jersey for the Champions Cup final. Tell me tell me very briefly, obviously, because I'm sure you could write a book about it. But mm -hmm. how how does that story go? No, I think it's just a it's a long term uh, long term vision. Really, I've always wanted to be a professional uh, rugby player, like since I was 10 years old, and all my all my life decisions were based on that. And um, so when I decided to go study in the UK, that was that was the the reason. Uh, because it was the only possibility for me to to I mean the only option to possibly have a chance of uh, of, of turning pro afterwards, and uh, so yeah, long term vision and uh, then yeah, a lot of hard work and fights, all the all the cliche things, but like yeah, hard work, sacrifices, and uh, and yeah, and I've been lucky to uh, to to live different adventures, particularly the one in Argentina that really switched something uh, in me, and uh, I think I've been lucky to meet the right people at the right moments, and uh, and everything just clicked really. But um, but yeah, it's all. It's all been a lot of work for a very long time, like a very, very long time. And uh, yeah, I'm just grateful that it finally happened and I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm loving it. And when you made that, when you made that move to Loughborough, was that because none of the academies in the top 14, none of the academies in France would snap you up? Is that why you moved to Loughborough or? Um, pretty much. But like, I mean, I didn't even, even, even ever consider going into an academy in France because I, I was nowhere. I was playing fly half like uh, at 18 in Brussels. Like uh, I was farming. I had no no chance. I, I tried to. Um, there was a selection process going on at Stade Français, with like uh, for under 15s, and um, it was at the time where like rugby was all about phys physique and everything. And um, and so uh, you know you fill in a form saying okay how much you measure, what's your weight, and everything. And the, the guys just replies straight away like don't bother coming. Like we just uh, he he's he's not in the criteria we're looking for, so it's not going to happen. So well, it was when I was 15 years old. It's more like. Um, How do you say? I've lost the word. Uh, anecdote, like it's just, just like a little bit voilà. But um, but no. So yeah, it was uh, it was just yeah. So like staying in Belgium was not an option because the the rugby that like, found the way they play rugby was not what I was uh, looking for. I was looking for something more more serious and more professional. In France, uh, it was either like studies or uh, rugby. And to go into rugby, you must have like at the time you must uh, you needed to have like a certain level or be like in the Pôle Espoir or, uh, or Pôle France or uh, already already in the academy setup. And um, and the UK was the only option with uh, with uh, with universities having a lot of teams and um, and having playing like uh, have teams that are playing at a good level and um, and yeah so that's why I decided to go to the UK really. And you mentioned it there. You were a fly half. You came yeah. over. <laughs> you you played in what the Loughborough fifth team as a fly half to begin with. Then you moved to sec so. How does the move to second row? Back row. Um, so actually, so I uh, so I was playing fly half until until the moment I joined the, the uni. So at uni, I played. Uh, this is the moment where I started to play second row. But um, there was a tricky one actually because when I arrived at the university, so there was uh, there was some selection uh, process going on to enter the club, which I wasn't aware of at the beginning. So I was like, I've chosen a university to play rugby. I, <laughs> I might not even make it. So uh, so uh, so I'm glad I did make it in the end. But um, so yeah, so the, the selection process was divided between forwards and backs, and uh, obviously I. At the time, I was a back, but knowing I had more like the the size of pa, the the height of a um, of a second row, and um, so I went to see the the first team director. I was like, "Listen, this is my uh, this is my context. Like, uh, what do you reckon?" And so I started going in the in the forwards thing, and then kept um, and then started playing this in second row uh, since then. And um, and yeah, that's been uh, that's been the way where it's switched. And at the beginning, it was quite special. Like, it felt like starting a 
a new sport really because obviously I was playing in very different positions on the pitch, in very different scenarios. And uh, but it was great to uh, to have like my experience of playing fly half, like the you know when you do like a little part of three forwards uh, off the um, off a ruck, like I was playing them like a two v two v one, trying to play the ball as much as I could. And uh, and yeah, but since then I really really enjoyed it. Really, I'm not missing playing fly half. Like I really enjoy playing for so uh, so yeah, happy days. A hell of a story, mate. Uh, and to jump then from Loughborough into Wasps, where you had some game time, and then obviously the scouting network at Toulouse picks you up, phones Ugo Mola and says, you have to look at this guy, bring him over, you sign, and a year later, you've won the biggest competition in Europe. Like, yeah, still can't some, believe it. <laughs> it's absolutely like something that I played I, for 16 years, tried, got absolutely nowhere a year, and you've nailed it in year one or two. For, like, it's insane. How does it feel? like In terms of your evolution, I, I know you're in a team with... Dupont and Intermac and it must feel almost like it's been very easy and it must have come easy but you now must look around and think what else can we go and win what else can we do look at the crop of people and the players we've got how exciting is it to be part of it all yeah no it's yeah obviously it's amazing it's an, an amazing feeling and like it's uh it's obviously a really really tough thing to do but yeah when you look at the at the quality of the players and the, the depth of the um, of the squad that we have like uh I don't want to say that it's logical, but like we we do have uh, occasions to uh, how do you say not no, occasions, but we do have a, a chance to uh, to take a, a good shot, and uh, and yeah, it happened. And um, but I think yeah, there's just a, a really good group of guys, and I, I was really surprised actually when I arrived in Toulouse by the the way the club is uh, is run. Um, I think that's one true uh, power that the club has, and well, obviously I haven't played in, uh, in thirty thousand clubs in, uh, in in France or Europe, but like it seems to me that it's a very special club. And at the beginning, I was quite impressed, really, of how how the club was functioning and running. And um, and I'm I think I'm starting to to understand how how the the, the club is winning so much because um, it truly is a special club. And the, we've all mentioned the journey there. It is <laughs> Benji said a film will be made about it. It probably will be one day. It sounds incredible, but the way you've had to come over to England back yourself graft johnny mentioned they're nottingham uh, you you play at wasps for a year like you, you've clearly had this self-belief all the way along i know you've been celebrating for three or four days it probably hasn't sunk in properly yet but have you have you had a chance to just sit back and reflect a little bit or speak to those close to you and just uh, just all that graft that you've been through that journey and and where you are now i mean you're only what you're 24 but it, it feels yeah. like almost the culmination already so have you, have you had a chance yeah, yeah. to reflect um, yeah, but I think it's on moments uh, like uh, it's when big things happen, like uh, like three days ago, that I that I really can look back and say, wow, this happened when I joined the club here. I was like, oh, okay, so this happened as well. But uh, but yeah, at the same time, like it's uh, so you mentioned self belief, and I think that's that's something for some reason I've had uh, for uh, for yeah for 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 a very long time. And uh, I remember actually when my uh, it's actually a, a bit funny story but like in my I remember my first ever game for Loughborough Fitz so I was uh, on the bench uh, so in the fifth team as a second row so it was really the last <laughs> the last resource for the club and uh, and for some reason I was in that bus going to the game and uh, I was looking by the window and I was like it's not a vision but I just thought like okay I, I'm in this position now but for some reason I know that in my final year at Loughborough I'll be in the first team and I'll be thinking of that moment where I was on that bus for my first game being on the bench uh, in second row and and for some reason, it did happen. But uh, but yeah, it's just just weird. But like, I don't know. I just believed it, and uh, and uh, and yeah, I think it's a uh, it's something that is very uh, very powerful to uh, to have the self belief. And I think that's something that I really uh, well, all the power, the mental power. That's something that I really kind of like. Obviously, not fully discovered, but uh, saw like um, more of it when I was in Argentina, where I, I saw like how how if you could play with uh, with you, play with yourself and understand how you are and how you need to be to achieve things and uh, and things do happen afterwards. And it's truly amazing. And, um, but yeah, so so on these moments, I I, I do reflect on, on what happens. But uh, but yeah, hopefully there's, there'll be some more, uh, some more nice memories to make. You mentioned that year in Argentina a couple of times. As a second row, when you were at Loughborough and then you went to, it was Newman, wasn't it, in Buenos Aires? Yeah. Was that a really pivotal, formative year in your in your career? Oh, 100 percent. I think it was the most decisive year of my life. Basically, it was. Uh, but for me, not just realistically, but uh, on a personal level, um, more than anything. But uh, yeah, it was 
the whole that whole year was an adventure really like uh, i went there like it was a so my degree was a two-year pro four-year program too. so the first two years were uh, normal lectures at the university the third year was a placement year and then i had a final year of, uh, of studies after that placement year so um so that's how i had like this year of like uh, of, of placement in argentina but uh I mean, I arrived in Argentina. I didn't have a placement. I didn't have a place to stay. Uh, I knew hardly, I knew no one. The only thing I had was uh, the contact of uh, so three coaches at Loughborough. So George Shooter was coach at Loughborough. He uh, he knew very well Marcos Yarza from uh, from Leicester, who did play, um, who used to play at uh, Newman. So he put me in contact with Marcos Yarza, who put me in contact with the club. And so the only thing I had arriving was a rugby club and uh, and someone picking and the manager of the club picking me up at the uh, at the airport on. Uh, on my arrival and um and yeah so that's how the whole year started and uh, and then just being like you know being by myself like uh, for the first time of my life not following like um you know school hours or uni courses or or uh, i just like had the occasion to uh, to do what i felt and what i wanted and uh, that was quite special and uh and then like so i did eventually i found a placement and um and the rugby club uh, went really well and everything and um and then yeah i just kept having that self belief and uh and wanted to work really hard so i think the big switch was in the uh the uh, inter season because i did two um two uh two half seasons because the the seasons are uh, um how do you say are uh, found, don't happen at the same time in europe found the northern and south hemisphere and um so at the inter season i uh, i didn't have holidays because i was uh, i was working 9 to 5 in uh, in my placement and uh but i kept like uh gymming every day running doing everything i could uh, eat properly like uh, i was doing everything and came back for the second uh, second half season in really good shape and um but also like the way i saw the people playing rugby in argentina was uh, was really special they were because i realized at some point like okay i'm working this hard but like on the pitch i'm not really enjoying myself like uh, i'm putting maybe too much pressure like it's not uh, it's not going that well and i saw my friends who were like not as serious and not as concerned about it but they're just having a great time and uh and yeah have a good game and everything and so this is where i started thinking oh, okay maybe i need to change this and that and approach the thing like this and not like that and blah blah, blah. and uh and so the mixture of like the the good prepare the good physical preparation i had the mental switch i had during the, that inter season i started moving up in the teams and uh, enjoying myself much more and uh and everything started uh switching to one uh towards uh enjoying myself and having tried to contribute to the team and have the, the best time possible and uh, and and then yeah, I went through the through the teams and, uh, and everything kicked on to there. How old are you? <laughs> Twenty four. Bloody hell! <laughs> Man, you've you you you've got already Some life. a lifetime. <laughs> Man, you've got a lifetime of memories. It's absolutely phenomenal what you've done, mate. It's 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 pretty impressive. It's it's great to see that if 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 you you know like you said the, the power of the human brain as long as you drive yourself and you decide to go through things nothing can stop you and i think the way that you relate your story and I, I hope i hope you're not keeping things away from us but you're so humble by the fact that you know you just learn everywhere that you go and you need to get better and how do i get better i learn from others and um There'll be loads of guys who come from professional setups who rock up in Newman because I've been to Newman to Marcos. I played with him two years at Leicester and I was there for his wedding. Went to visit the club. Oh, it's, amazing. It's, it's, not, it's not the same. Huh? It's beautiful. <laughs> it's all wooden cabins everywhere and, and stuff, but yeah. it's amateur rugby from, from Argentina. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they don't touch it. They look at the weights, but they don't touch them. And, uh, and, and, and it's, complete, it's a completely different mindset. And so for you not to be, you know, to like be snobbish or whatever, say, what is this professional setup? And you just went there to get what you wanted to build yourself as a, as a human, as a man. And then obviously that was going to replicate on, on, on the pitch for you and fair play to you. It's well-deserved. You just worked hard for it and now you're, you're getting the results. Yeah, yeah. But I think I just believe that there's a, I've always believed that there's a lot of things to take from, uh, from every uh, individual, really from any person, any, any situation. And, uh, and from Argentina, I definitely took a lot. Uh, there was a lot to learn. And uh, as I said, like more in the, the way they approach the, the sports and the, the passion they have, the the fraternity, the um, all the human values that they had, it was really embodied in the club, and it was amazing to be to be part of that and to uh, to be part of that family really. And uh, and I think for the it was the the first time like uh, as a not full grown up but like, as a more mature person that I was playing uh, in a family because at university was a bit different. Like you know, a lot of people come in, come out like every year. Like, it changes a lot. There's a lot of things going on uh, the side. But they're like, uh, you know, the, the love of the shirts and, um, and the passion for the game and everything that I've, I've lived moments there, like uh, some emotional things. And that's, that's some things that we talk about with the two, so there's two Argentine players in, uh, in the Toulouse squad. And that's something we, I've, I've told them a few times, like, 
I've lived the, some emotions I've lived there uh, in Argentina are the most uh, most powerful ones I've ever lived in my life. It was a uh, it was impressive. And you mentioned throughout all of this journey, you always had it in your mind that you wanted to get back to the top fourteen or get to the top fourteen, get back to France and and play there. So. How did that move come about? And, and Toulouse is about as special a club as you can go to. So how did the move to Toulouse come about? Was that the perfect one for you? Um, yeah, well, I, I think, uh, no, basically, it, uh, so when I came back from Argentina, I had my final year of study to do. Then I was looking to go back to France, but it didn't really, didn't really click because um, uh, for some, for, for a few reasons. But uh, then Wast approached me. And then uh, and then finally, uh, after a few months playing at Wast, I met uh, Pierre Moncamp, who was uh, an ex-Toulouse coach and working at the time at Bath as a defense coach i think and um and yeah so we just uh, we met at the warm up uh, before before so we were playing at home against bath and um so i met him at the warm up as ah, yeah, you french okay yeah so i didn't know who he was and um and so uh, so we met we, we had a little chat at the warm up then uh, the, the game happened and uh, and then we uh, we stayed in contact a bit on linkedin at the beginning and then we uh, exchanged our numbers and, uh, and then we said yeah if at some point you uh, you want to come over uh, to uh, well, to visit the training center or you know have a chat at some point uh, with pleasure blah blah and, uh, and the occasion happened uh, I had some, a little little injury so I went to see him and um, and then so he spoke to Toulouse uh, about me and um, and then I remember receiving that uh, that message from uh, from Hugo like uh, I think it was in November 20, 2019 so uh, and he sent me that message yeah this is Hugo from Toulouse uh, voilà, if you're available for a quick chat we'd like to talk about your future um so uh so yeah receiving that text was uh, was magical um but, but yeah it was just actually when i when i re re explain the story like it's actually crazy how quickly everything happened from argentina to love to wasp to to lose like in uh in literally two years well, now it's been the same gap between uh two years ago and now winning the the european cup but uh everything happened so quickly but uh but yeah and then the, um yeah so Toulouse uh, seemed to be interested and uh once all the uh, all the the criteria were were okay, and the because uh, obviously how COVID happened and the the, the contract negotiations. Well, once everything was sorted, it was it was ready, and it was yeah, I was really happy to to join the club. And uh, and I think Toulouse is was as I mentioned earlier, Toulouse is a is a great club to be to be part of, and um, and I think it's truly special. So uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm really happy. How angry is Bronken going to be now that you're at Toulouse and he's at Cast and he's the head coach there? He's going to be <laughs> raging that he gave you a leg up in Toulouse. Mate, it's awesome. It's yeah. an amazing story. I wanted to ask you simply, what countries are you qualified to play for internationally? You mentioned Belgium, you've mentioned England, and obviously you're now in France. So where are you qualified to play? If you're going to, like, you seem like such a level-headed bloke. I've commented on your game so far this year. Like, I think you're destined for massive things if you keep going the way you're going. Mm -hmm. So which way is your head? Like, if you're looking at international honours, which I'm sure the way you've talked about being on the bus for the fifths at Loughborough and fighting for higher honours, I'm sure it's only going to go one way. Which way is your head leaning? Where would you like to represent? No, I'm I'm, I'm French, so uh, my, my dream is to play for France. It's always been my dream, and uh, and voilà, that's pretty much it, really. I, uh, it's, a, it's a dream, it's an objective, and uh, and uh, yeah, I hope it will happen one day. Well, mate, I saw this morning Fabian Galti is drafting a sixty-man squad for Australia, so keep your phone on, because um, <laughs> mate, you've got all the ingredients, absolutely. And look, you remind me one hundred percent of young French guys that I absolutely loved working with, like Anthony Jalonche, who will be a teammate of yours next mm -hmm. year. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. Wonderful bloke, totally level-headed, absolute grafter. Um, and you're, you're really similar personality-wise, and you've got all the natural talent in the world. So uh, absolutely incredible. I want to ask you again, <laughs> Thank you. coming into Toulouse and being surrounded by legends, like the legacy the club has, the history, the, the trophies that they've won, but also in your position, you, you come in, you come off the bench in a cup final, but you've also can undertaken an apprenticeship underneath Joe Takori, who's probably old enough to be your dad, and the Arnold bros, who the twins, who look are two of the best in their field. So what's it like? They, they must add completely different things, but those guys and the different things that they add, what are they like to be around and what are you picking up from them? Because they're absolutely world-class and they're superstars. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it's uh, it's so beneficial. But uh, you cited the uh, players in the second row, but there could be so many. Like uh, I really like working with uh, with Jerome Kano as well. Um, there's so many, so much to learn from from all these players. But uh, yeah, from Tikori, I think it's, I love his uh his human approach to the to the club. Like he's a true, he's well, you probably uh 
heard that a few times, but he's uh, the the father of the of the club. Where he he yeah, he's got the the great values and a impressive human, uh, more than a, an impressive uh, player. Like he's truly impressive, and it's great to be to be around him and to uh, to see how how he approach things, how he talks to the group, how he leads the group, how he uh, uh, goes up to the coaches, uh, talks with them, and uh, maybe confront them at some points. So, but at the same time, you know, he's a he's a, like a team member. Like a, he's a, he's good in the changing room. Like a, you know, like a, he's good a, on the celebration. Like he's just everywhere. So it's a nice, it's absolutely amazing to be to be around him and the and the two other brothers as well. Like two great characters as well, and um, and perhaps a bit more um, my my profile of a of player. Uh, um, and uh, and it's great to be learning from them, uh, especially like all the in all the Lila. That's a, that's a massive um, area of improvement for me. In terms of calling the line out, and uh, so it's great to be uh, around them to to learn from that, and even in the in the game style, in the the activity activity they have in the, on the field, like it's it's great to see how they uh, how they play, how they approach um, the certain aspects of the game, the the level of uh, combativity they they put in the game, and uh, now it's it's impressive, and uh, it's great to be found. Obviously, that's when I arrived at Wasp at the beginning it was impressive to be uh, surrounded by old fans. To, to be part of the group with so many great players and it have fun. it's the same here in Toulouse but uh, it's uh it's just uh, when I, it's like when I said earlier like uh, yeah there's so many things to take from everyone like uh, it's, this is the case uh, even more uh, even more here we have to just quickly ask you about Joe I mean we've, we've spoken about him already we've spoken about the celebrations you mentioned how impressive he is mm-hmm. in all those different arenas you mentioned it yourself on a night out you've got a lot of self-belief can you keep pace with Big Joe or not? <laughs> Honestly, being uh, being totally realistic, I think it's very hard to keep pace with uh, <laughs> with Tuchel Curry. He is he is a machine. Honestly, I don't know how he does it. Honestly, he just he just smashes it. <laughs> he's, he's too good. Someone told us that um, Jin was his kryptonite, didn't they? Do you remember that, Johnny Benji? Someone someone told us was that was that Joe? Just give him some gin, and that's that's how to deal with Joe on a night out. I think it's sushi. I think it was Census Johnson who said that, <laughs> but. I know for a fact that Sensu Johnson would 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 buckle in front of Joe Dickory, so he's probably <laughs> saying that out of, out of pure jealousy. I, I I've tried many many times. He he will uh, wobble, but he will never fall. Never. Oh yeah, impossible. That's impossible. Oh, he's he's impressive. Honestly, he fight drinks anything, anytime, any amount. He's he's a machine. And in terms of this week's celebration, mate, give us the podium. Who are the three that have gone the hardest and ended up in the worst state? Who's been your gold, silver, and bronze. We, we've seen Peter, we've seen some of the celebrations, but who has properly let loose and celebrated this the most? Um, well, one of, one of them that actually comes to my mind like uh, is uh, Yannick Uyut. Uh, you probably saw the, the pictures of him when we, when we left Toulouse before going to, uh, to London. Like He was leading the charge. Like It was impressive. You, if you haven't, there, there are some pictures on, uh, on internet. It's absolutely impressive. He's a, he's a great character and he's really good friends with Joe as well. Like They're, they're quite similar on that aspect. But uh, no, obviously. So uh, Joe has been uh, has been very very strong. Sitting by as well has been has been doing really well. Uh, has been smashing it a lot. Um, and uh, now Romain Tamak as well, um, who has been really good. Uh, Richie Arnold as well. Now the two brothers actually. Now I think there's a good there's a good group of like 10, 15 uh, that hasn't stopped for like three days. <laughs> it's, it's, it's impressive. No, it was amazing. Honestly, it's. Yeah, it was just non-stop for three days. And yeah, I love it. <laughs> I just love it. And you mentioned a lot of the experienced players there who you're obviously enjoying working with. Um, the listeners will be interested in the likes of Roman Entomac, Antoine Dupont, getting all the headlines at the moment. That younger group of superstars, really, at Toulouse. How have they been in terms of welcoming you into the fold at the club, showing you the ropes? Have they been good? Yeah, really good, really, really, really good. Actually, they uh, now they're really some 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 good guys. And uh, now since uh, since the first day, really, they already uh, they um, you know they come to chat to me and uh, have a little talk and stuff. And since then, like start to becoming friends. And uh, and now there's just a, a great group of uh, of guys. And uh, it's uh, it's just like uh, going to the club every day is uh, is an absolute pleasure. And to uh, it's just like it's become a family really. And uh, so the younger guys, the, the older guys, everyone like they've all been really good. And uh, I know it's it's great to you know, even so on the um, on the friendship kind of side it'd be really good on the rugby stick uh, uh, point of view as well like now they're just just a great uh, great roof and transmission and, uh, and and family living really. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Timo. It's been amazing to hear about your journey and the celebrations. And judging by 
the looks on Johnny and Benji's faces throughout this. Uh, it's been like listening to a film, really, if that's possible, a film script. So um, sign us up. We're, we'll invest I'll in the watch film. It. I'll watch it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for having me on. It's a pleasure to meet you guys, and uh, and yeah, hopefully see you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs> you too, and on mate. top of that, he's polite and nice. <laughs> oh, man, he's lovely. Freak of nature, this guy. Well done. Take a bow, mate. <laughs> well, bloody hell! <laughs> what, what a story, <laughs> my man. What I mean, a boy, Ben. You're out of work, mate. You <laughs> keep going until he retires, and then you're done. Oh, like. One one thousand percent. I mean, I think I'd rather <laughs> listen to him than to me. He's <laughs> He's, he's he's already he's only 24 he's got a shit ton of stuff i thought i traveled mate he just took his backpack went 700 times around the world cool stories about the fact that he didn't care just you know had a vision in his head i think that's absolutely outstanding just proves you know the the, the bigger men make bigger players and then that's really what's got him there to to his level is his dedication that resilience that that graft with a pretty level-headed um, I mean, he mentioned that he kept up his studies and stuff. It's it's it's, uh, it's a it's a dream boy, come yeah. true type of story, and it's bloody brilliant. Fair play for Toulouse for spotting. Sure, I mean, yes, of course, he's a very good player, but it's not like you spotted, you know, the the the, the Eden Elizabeth. You weren't going going to look, you know, for the ginormous sort of over physical second row. So you saw also had to spot his ability of ball handling, his ability in the yeah. line out, his ability to cover a lot of ground and his ability just to be a smart dude on the pitch. And, Mate, and that's what they spotted. Well done. That is it. It is his smarts. That is exactly why he's now standing. The fact that you can convert from standoff and become what I, like I, caught, I watched him against, it was cast to lose maybe four or five weeks ago. I was like, that kid's going to be in the French team. He can call a line out. He can ball, he can offload, he can pass, he can run, he can do everything. And he's a smart, diligent, hardworking kid. He's amazing. Like, unbelievable story. Um, mate, he's 100% going to... I don't want to put too much pressure on him, but if Fabian Galti is looking at the next generation, who to bleed in for the next potentials for 2023, you're looking at 60 people to go to Australia. Mate, 100%. If you're looking for a smart bloke that can pick things up quickly, absorb different skill sets, and become a leader quickly... There's your man. What a boy! They're, they're, not, they're, not, ta- they're not taking. They're not taking sixty, Johnny. He he, he said a sixty. He's looking group, at they're sixty. Forty two. They're taking yeah. forty two. Don't get they're taking hundred, mate. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm excited for him. Like I mean, what's not to like? The kid. Oh yeah. What a journey. Sure, it's a dream story. Heineken, Heineken Cup winner already, and he's 24, and he's just getting started. So good and a lovely boy. So so good to talk to him. But also in this ultra professional era, we won't see many stories like that again, Benji. And exactly as, as an inspiration Rare. to guys playing at Tunbridge Wells or wherever they're playing, like so many. When he was detailing his story there, so many chance meetings <laughs> before the game no, at Bath. With I, I in, don't believe I one. don't believe in chance. Yeah, I don't believe in chance. I really believe in in preparation, meeting, and uh, an opportunity. Oh, he's and taking his really, chances, doesn't he? But they, the yeah, way it's kind of built them, out. And, and he's built them, he's pushed for them. Uh, I mean, how many guys would have got to, to Loughborough and after six months would be like, listen, I'm on the bench playing second round of 15, I'm going. you be on the beers. And they just give up or or you just give up and you leave. But on top of that, he's stuck with his with his studies. And the only reason why he went to Argentina is because he had that year away that he needed to do. That means he got to third year of his studies. So he still passed his grades and all that. Then to go to, man, he could have gone anywhere in the world. If you're a bit of a, not a bit of a wanker, you know, but if you're like a 21 year old and you want, and you want to have a fun, I don't think Argentina will be your go-to. I, I would love Argentina and stuff, but you need to know your rugby, but you could go to the States. You can go to Australia in England. Everybody goes to Australia. Everybody does like six months in NZ or Australian stuff because there's the sun and there's no language barrier. He decided to actually challenge himself with another language barrier because he's not even a full English speaking from, from the get go. So he's just, yeah, smart, brave. And like you said, Tim, if it can show to anyone, if you have a dream and you believe hard, rugby is one of those sports where a few different pathways can get you there, right? Outstanding sort of um, technical ability is absolutely necessary if you're going to play certain positions, 9, 10, and whatever. For others, let's face it, you can compensate pretty quick. And, and, and so you could basically start with one sport and go to another. What you, what you need to have is a massive heart, a will to work, a no, uh, be open-minded and humble enough to actually get, you know, be resilient and dust yourself off and, and go, go again. And that's what he's done. So I, I totally agree with you. I think it's a brilliant, brilliant example 
of how rugby can be full of different characters because big characters make better better players. They really do. And just going back to the game, to it feels weird going back to the game now to talk about it after hearing about that incredible journey. But he was there at the end, Thibaut, to seal the deal. Um, we talked about the red card earlier on. We shouldn't have been surprised, should we, about how well La Rochelle coped with being down to 14 men. Obviously, the, there's the story of Ronan O'Gara when he was at Racing, the top 14 final, 2016, Maxime Machineau gets sent off. They win. Was any part of you surprised by how well they dealt with it? Or were you? did you know that, that it was going to be tougher to lose anyway? I think there's two, there's two things. There's... If- if you position yourself as in La Rochelle seat, then you're like, oh, how do we deal with this? But there's also the main mistakes that all the teams do when they're one man up. So typically to lose, it is like we need to overplay, overstretch ourselves, try to kill the game within the next 10 minutes. Whereas he got expelled at 25th minute. There's still a bloody long time on the clock to go, right? It's not like it's the last moment. And, and the classic mistake is that, oh, just chuck the ball around. It's one more. One more is a hell of a lot, but it's not that much, you know? And, and so the classic mistake, I think, that what that Toulouse did well is that they, didn't, they basically stuck to their plan. They played absolutely identical, whether there was one man warm or not. But you could know that in the back of their mind that you're going to grind them. There's going to be the extra effort element and this and that. The only thing that I thought they could have done is that there's one or two opportunities where you could just play the overlap that's in front of you. Expose yourself a tiny bit more. That's why we saw La Rochelle coping so long. So basically, I think La Rochelle did really well. But Toulouse on purpose did not try to change anything to their strategy and they just picked and they were patient enough and smart enough to pick that one opportunity they had, which was that beautiful pass of Romain Tamak and then Tolo Fua back inside to Malia. But let's not forget that there's a crazy, amazing, uh, good cover tackle from Geoffrey Doumerou who picks up Chelsea and Colby a meter from the line where everybody thought he scored. And if he scores that in the first half, then it's a different game. I think as well, you have to congratulate some of the key players from La Rochelle. So even a man down, like you think of the performance of Antonio, mm. like scrum time around the pitch, the physicality, Bugarit, Dumaru, you mentioned, like some of their boys were absolutely phenomenal. And I think we touched on it right at the start. It wasn't a, I think if it'd been a classic top 14 game, it would have opened up and Toulouse maybe kicked into another gear, start pushing offloads, find gaps and they run away with it. But it was such an arm wrestle. It was such a dogfight, like, the contest on the ground, massive men trying to slow the ball down. Everything was a shit fight. And La Rochelle stuck in it. Like the, the difference in the end for me came down to a kicking battle where Intimac takes away 100% of his shots at goal and, and West unfortunately lets a couple slip. Uh, otherwise, it could have quite easily have had a 14-man La Rochelle side playing with 60 minutes. They could have come away and won that game. Like the dog, the organization, the structure and the scrap that they showed to stay in it with 14 men for that length of time was hugely impressive. Um, and look, I think strangely, they'll take away quite a bit of belief. Actually, do you know what? Like we can match it. We've played Toulouse before in top 14. We absolutely can do this. They've got a side. That they're not going to lose many players over the next season or two. I don't think many key players. They're going to add a bit of talent. So look, they should absolutely take confidence from where they've been, the grind that they've been and the fact that they probably could have edged it even with 14 blokes. I think they'll make a real tilt now at this top 14 title, coming away from that thinking we can really do this. Um, but look, I thought they were phenomenal. Those aspects, the physicality, the breakdown, the way they stuck to their guns, the way they defended, like they're really well organized in D as well. They didn't let much slip. Um, it, was just a, it was just a shame. That, that 14 man, I think it was just enough to, to tip it the other way. And again, those precious points that were missed at goal until his win. And you mentioned that, Johnny, Ehi West. Um, he was superb in the semi-final. He signed, Mate, a new con- he signed a new contract after that semi-final as well. He's it amazing. feels cruel to, to mention him, but obviously he did leave eight points out there. And it, I suppose the style of fly half that he is, it is not one that you would ordinarily look at Ronan O'Gara and think those two, he's not, he's not the same well, kind of player as Ronan was. So, but, but you say that, but Ronan O'Gara has obviously changed and evolved and been exposed to different cultures and different ways of playing. He's been at Racing, he's been at Crusaders. So it's not the kick, clap, kick tight corners, kick your goals rugby that we saw in Munster. Like Ronan O'Gara has added masses to himself and his rugby IQ and his knowledge. Um, and look, there's no, I cannot sit here and Benji can't, we can't criticize kickers. We've never put ourselves in that position or taken on that kind of pressure. It is something we've never done. Um, and I love him as a player. I think he's absolutely terrific and quite rightly, 
as the shift has gone, there's, there's a lot of non-Jeef players moving out of the top 14. I think he's pivotal to a lot of what is absolutely great about La Rochelle. And look, it's one of those, it's a big moment and a massive platform and it's just slipped, but he's converted 99.9 of every other chance he's had for in the top 14 with La Rochelle since he's been here. So it's one of those games, it's gone now. Um, but as I said, with him moving forward, they've got a massive tilt now at the top 14 title. I think they will take a lot from that game with him because um, he's outstanding and, and there's no reason why they can't kick on and win that one now. And I don't know what more we can say about him, but Antoine Dupont was named European Player of the Year after the game. He stood out again, didn't he, Benji? <laughs> well, I don't. I actually don't think he had the best game, but because there was nothing really much for him to do, to be honest. He was industrious, um, they, they wasn't he? He to... made made a lot of tackles, carries, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, he, he he's always. I think it was more to to celebrate his, his entire um, his his entire competition. And to be fair. He, he smashed it so he did it really well he, he's added sort of a few strings to you know to to his, his capacity this you're always asking yourself where the hell is he going to stop I mean he, he yeah he can tackle he can he can cover tackle he can compete on the floor and I'm thinking yeah even in the game that's tight and it's not particularly open you just need a grafter he can be the grafter if you want the electric off the base pace um, dynamic number nine, he can do it. If you want the single, the Mike Phillips who can hand off, you know, big fellas and actually create breaks on his own, he can do it. So, He's a and, and now his kicking game, and his kicking game that, he, that Toulouse used a hell of a lot to get out of the long half and stuff was spot on during the whole game. And those those little key moments when La Rochelle did not get out of their half uh, as well uh, were, were problematic. So, apart from the tiny little brain fart that they had, again, four seconds from, from the final whistle of the biggest game of their lives, uh, he, he did outstandingly well. You know, of course, he's a beautiful European player of the year. Did you see the offload that he threw when he was being taken out like the trash by Big Will Skelton? <laughs> did you see that? But again, just the presence of mind, the timing, the rugby now, mate, he's got everything. And look, from one week to another, we talk about his acceleration or his handoff or his tackle break or his kicking game and you just like you think you're going to run out of stuff and then this week he played like an extra back rower like those times we played against Mike Phillips you'd sometimes he'd talk about being an extra back rower for a laugh because he was tall but Antoine Dupont actually this weekend was smashing boys competing for ball repeat efforts getting back to his feet like a proper set <laughs> like just insane and that's it is how many different sides can he show his qualities he can do absolutely everything on rugby field and that's why maybe it wasn't the most standout glittering performance but absolutely you can appreciate what he does in rugby field every single different week there's something to to, to applaud he's just superb to watch and quite rightly it wasn't the, the most spectacular final but absolutely quite rightly the european player there he was terrific again we mentioned the challenge cup final a little bit earlier on um you were there benji your old club leicester should they have taken the points a little bit more that uh, they dominated in the forwards for quite long periods. It, will they look at it as one that got away? I'd say so. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. It's, it's not so much taking the points. There's one opportunity where they could have taken the points, but they ended up going in the corner and scoring. So, so they were right to, to, to do so. I just thought they, they, they could have taken the chance and attack a little bit more because when they did, they were actually pretty lethal, put Montpellier into a world uh, under a world of pain, but they just didn't convert their opportunities. There's like a passage of play of 10 minutes before halftime where they really are pounding on the line. And you think, you know, George Ford is carrying all the way to the line and using all those little options of the short ball, the long ball and the behind and stuff. And, and just when you repeat that and repeat that and repeat that, that's when I saw Eddie Jones sort of league style uh, type of running and stuff. And that's what I thought was very impressive. But look, it's like they absolutely demolished them in the front. And I don't know if you remember, but at one point there's a driving mall, a dummy driving mall, and they actually shifted to Ben Youngs, who did really well when he came on, added a lot of pace to the game. And he's trying to find... Ben Youngs went full tilt at the back of the line out where everybody thought it was driving mall. So the defense of Montpellier was already a little bit consumed in there. And he's just looking for Nadolo at the shoulder. Except he looks, he looks, and Nadolo is six meters behind him. So he gives it behind, and Nadolo... Dugudum, 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 boom, and he gets whacked by three defenders of a Leicester. So you're like... You know, all that effort and all that grind to actually go through something, but you're not doing things 
in the most efficient way. So it, it was very frustrating to see them do do that. I mean, I was commentating, and next to me there was Benny K, Hugo Modio, and I was looking at Benny. I was like, bloody! I was like showing my foot, like tell him to stop kicking. And he was <laughs> like, well, you know, we can't do anything about it. So no, it's a shame. But listen, in in the whole, in the long run. Leicester still, it was the first final at all for the last, what, six years or seven years or eight years or something. So it's a fantastic way of gradually getting back at it. Maybe Borthwick is deciding that strategy because he thinks that the boys still need to, to build gradually and get better. And they really are getting better. And, and, and I'm delighted to see it. And on the flip side, Montpellier, obviously you mentioned the emotional scenes at the end for them. We've also chatted about this in previous weeks. Is Philippe, going to keep the track seat on or is he going to kick back and relax he is. now <laughs> no he is mate he, he was actually almost not not gutted at all but it's not <laughs> what he wants he's not what he wants now they've signed Bruce Rihanna uh, the former Northampton firm guy in Bristol and all that so he's going to come in to take care of the skills Olivier Azam and Jean-Baptiste Elissa are staying in there and then Philippe but because at the moment Franck is not happening Franck Azema so they can't agree on a, on a transfer not a transfer fee but like on a fee um, and so they've called it quits and because they're doing well then the Montpellier president is like well you know wh- why would I break the bank I mean we're doing okay so yes of course Philippe says he doesn't want to do it but he'll do it uh, I think it will just be a, a bit of a tricky one if things don't go absolutely uh, ideally in by November December then what do you do then you can't bring somebody on his own and that's complicated and then you're back to square one so I just that's what I think they're they're making a mistake but if there's nobody, you're not going to take somebody to th- for the sake of it. But you've been in this situation before, especially when things aren't going well in the club and they bring in a coach to, it's almost damage limitation. So Felix San Andreas come in, he stripped it back to basics. They seem to be enjoying themselves more and more. And you can see the smile they have on their faces when they're playing and they're stringing together some decent stuff. But ultimately, Felix San Andreas doesn't want that role and doesn't want to be there and wants to be more managerial post they're going to have to bring somebody in because there's only so much that that change and the positive effect and the wave that he brings in can last. <laughs> Watch this space. More on that next week. Uh, thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Benji. A massive thanks to Thibaut Flamon for joining us and sharing his incredible journey with us. Um, and thanks to all of you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. And we'll be back with another, with another episode next week. Au revoir, guys. Cheers. See you, fellas.